Um, so we started on time at 12 minutes past three, and in the uh, period before that, the obligation is to sample the wind between nine minutes before the start for a five minute period to four minutes before the start. So we're very careful about how we monitor that, and the breeze was essentially, and we corrected it um, with a northerly flowing current of 0.6 of a knot today. So it actually increases, um, you know, it, it makes the boats getting pulled into the wind have a little bit more wind. So, you know, we were only just over the wind limit, I'd say, you know, on the way we measured on our boat, sort of circa seven knots. Uh, it was bouncing around a little bit. Um, but by the time that the, you know, the boats had done a lap, it was probably below that, you know, it was bordering on six and a half knots, which is the wind limit. And obviously at the finish, it was under the wind limit, you know. So it took them, um, New Zealand, 19 minutes to do the first three legs. And that was evaporating quickly. And it took them, well, 27 plus to do the last leg. So obviously the wind was was very, very light. So, um, so the wind round... Uh, Four o'clock, that was the yeah, second part of the question? Yes. At, at it, the end, it, roughly at the end of the race. Yeah, look, we were looking to start at 10 past four and in the sampling period before that, um, the wind never made the wind limit, so it was under 6.5 knots. And the, then the wind never increased again? No, the wind died. Um, the most wind we saw after that was coming around North Head on the way home, so. So, Sir Ben, another difficult day? But it seems, uh, maybe it's a stupid question, but your boat looks fast when you are not foiling. You came back on the Team New Zealand. Good observation, Bruno. <laughs> Top marks. Yeah, we seem to have found a sweet spot between sort of six and a half and seven knots. But no, in all seriousness, we, uh, we struggled a lot, uh, again, against the, the Kiwis in the first uh, t two laps and sort of, again, highlighted some of our issues that we're, we're working on. So you had to race today because of the rules, but uh, you go to the shed tonight or tomorrow morning? Yeah, I think we've got to spend the next two or three weeks uh, making some big changes to, to the setup. And you know, clearly, as you keep saying, there's sort of issues with our performance in the, in the downspeed sections. And we're, we're obviously trying to evaluate that, work out quite what's causing that, and then rectify it. And uh, we haven't got long, you know, in the scheme of things, making some of these modifications, depending how serious they are, can take the boat out of action for weeks. So we've got to measure up just what sort of performance game we think we can, we can make versus time off the water and get ourselves in a position to be competitive. Peter, it seems that you have to sail sometimes very low to stay on foils. Is that uh, obvious? It's obvious on television, but uh, you have to do that? Yeah, well, I think as you know, Ian said, it was obviously pretty light today, and you know, at times we were definitely you know, doing everything we could to stay on the foils. Um, yeah, and generally sailing quite wide is the best way to do that. But no, we felt like we made some pretty good gains, you know, on the performance we put or down in those first couple of laps compared to when we um, first Luna Rossi yesterday. And yeah, you know, for us, it's just you know about continuing to learn and you know, for getting that last opportunity to get a. A nice pre-start against um, you know someone, which is you know could be our last shot before the cup. So that's you know, pretty um, you know exciting times ahead for us. Did you consider jibing at some point on the on the windward leg instead of tacking? We heard that on television. Oh, we're always talking about about things, but you know generally when you're going upwind, um, you know tack or a jibe, they're, they're both pretty hard to, to pull off, and you know we didn't want to you know start heading back downwind um, while on the upwind leg. What do you think of those three racing days? But where do you where do you find the other the competitors compared to you? Yeah, well, I think um, you know the first three days are obviously pretty incredible. Um, yeah, I think it's blown me away how many people have been out on the water um, or and supporting from home. You know how many messages messages we've been getting. Um, you know, it just seems like the the nations you know fully getting excited by the America's Cup, which is something that, you know, we find, you know, incredibly exciting and, you know, we hope the, the other challenges here find exciting as well. And, you know, it's something that, you know, it's been a, a lot of time 
in the making and you know, to actually see these boats coming together and you know, being able to match race, you know, being able to tack and manoeuvre in close quarters to each other and you know, having some tight racing with lead changes, you know, um, kind of what more can you ask for? And you know, I think that first day of the Christmas Cup, um, you know, we were in that Southwester on you know, course C was something that, you know, we've all been, you know, pretty excited about, you know, actually racing in there with, you know, a whole heap of boats around. And, you know, I think it's been, you know, pretty incredible to showcase, um, you know, what's going to happen for the rest of the summer. Max, are you pleased with your performance so far? I'm never pleased because uh, I'm always uh, want to improve. But I think, uh, as Pete said, um, it's been an opportunity, you know, for the first time after a few years to sail uh, all together for the for the first time with this new class. I think uh, it was interesting to see all the fleet in uh, in different range of wind, and um, so I think everyone is going to go back home in the shed and uh, spend a few days of uh, debrief uh, uh, from uh, all the information and the data we we take after the these uh, three uh, racing days, and. Um, I think I'm pleased with the fact how the team react. After the first day, I heard many come and Luna Ross is already in trouble. And, and, and up to yesterday afternoon, we were able to play to win the event. So this is sport. I mean, one day you're down, the next day you're up. So I think uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty tricky day. And we're looking forward to start the competition in January. Terry, did you enjoy those uh, three days of racing? Yeah, we did. Um, you know, the boats are pretty incredible pieces of equipment, and it's unlike anything certainly I've ever raced before. And so uh, the days that we've had out, uh, I'm, you can't help but be impressed at the level that all the teams have gotten to so quickly. Um, the fact that the racing is as close as it is so quickly in the first generation of a boat is um, pretty impressive. And, you know, it speaks volumes to the design teams and to the engineers and the build teams behind the sailors that are out on the water because they are incredible pieces of equipment. So I think from a American Magic perspective, it's nice to um, to feel like we haven't done a lot of things uh, out in a corner and that the boat is reasonably competitive. But, you know, I think like all four of us sitting here, we all have a lot of work to do. So, you know, it's not what was on the water today won't win the regatta. So no break, you start working tomorrow? Yeah, we're gonna, we'll um, go for a sail tomorrow. Maybe we'll go for a sail on Tuesday. Um, keep chipping along at a couple of the things that, that um, we have in the boat. And again, each, each opportunity that you get to sail against another team uh, presents challenges and problems that you see in yourself. And so we'll go out to try to answer some of those tomorrow and, and work on getting better. And, and uh, yeah, and then enjoy the weekend and enjoy Christmas. No code zero today? That means we will never see any code zero on the water? Yeah, I think if it wasn't going to happen today, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the, the, I can't speak for, for our, um, the others, but I certainly in our world that um, it always feels that once the boat's up, uh, if you're up on the fro, uh, then you should be up on the J1, and then the drag of that sail is too punitive to, uh, to you know, if you're if your competitor is on the J1 and you're on the fro, uh, he's going to be miles ahead of you. So you might as well learn how to do it with the J1. But do you have a code zero on board? Uh, well, we had one in the chase boat. Yeah, yeah. So we were uh, we were contemplating it. We knew um, Luna Rosa's uh, quite agile in the lighter air, and so uh, you kind of you kind of would be taking a, a punt at it, though. I mean, you'd be you'd be in a spot that. Uh, you were counting on displacing at a certain point through the through the race to uh, finish, and uh, so yeah, it, it doesn't really uh, seem to be all that beneficial in a in speed world. Thank you. I have a question for Francesco Longanesi Catani. Uh, what about organizing the Christmas race before Easter? <laughs> well, that depends. Can rename it. That depends on the defender as well. I mean, we. We may ask to the defender whether they agree to postpone the race to another date. And uh, if they agree, we have to see if the, the feasibility 
of organizing a race because it's not uh, something which is simple, especially in the current conditions with the Christmas break and everything. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Matt? Really a question for either of you up on the stage, or any of you. Uh, in hindsight, is the six and a half knot wind limit at the lower end, is it, is it too low for these falling boats? Um, should it be higher? Does anyone believe that it should be higher? I think you should answer it in Greek. I didn't dare to ask you that question. Phone call. I can answer if you want. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, it's been no secret that, you know, we've tried to design a boat that can go across a wind range, and, you know, the thing like Ian said, we were just above that wind range when the race started. You know, the first three legs we foiled around, the breeze dropped, and, you know, we couldn't continue foiling, but at a wind strength that was below it. So, you know, for us, it's obviously a big challenge to sail these boats in the lighter air, and, you know, there's also a time limit. You know, I'd prefer to be trying to sail around a racetrack and then bouncing up against a time limit and then sitting tight up against a chase and nice breeze. Other comments? Max? Yeah, I think we should lower the wind limit to four, so it will be easier for Ian as well, and we just go in displacement. Why? Next. Why? No? <laughs> Next question. Hi, Richard Gladwell from Sailworld. For Ian, can you run through these dates and situation with um, sailing in a coordinated manner? Going right through to through to March. When see what, what's going to happen with it in terms of the defender? They can't sail against anyone till the sixth of March. Are you going to declare any free sailing days or, or anything like that in the interim? Um, we're look. We're we're investigating. Um, you know, not only I think the race boats need practice. So do the race officials and everyone else. And um, Certainly, my perspective is that, you know, I would like to be out there on some more days. Um, clearly, there aren't any days on the schedule at the moment. So, you know, the days that I had pencilled in in my diary were the 7th, 8th, um, 11th and 12th, as maybe days that, uh, you know, it might be possible, but there's a lot of agreement needed on all of that and if we were able to get out there and whether we're out there as race officials practicing our stuff and putting a course down but obviously there's um, requirements from the the maritime and the harbour and and then there's the you know the pieces that you've spoken about about sailing in a coordinated manner that all of those things need to be resolved but you know my vote would be to get out there, and so when the competition starts, you know, we're more polished than we are now. And can you just cover off what's the situation with having to declare their configuration for the first round of the um, Prada Cup? What date is that? Is that the 8th of January? That's in the measurement department, so... I, I, yeah, it's somewhere around there. I'm not exactly sure. So these guys have really only got, what, 18, 19 days left? And counting. Next. Uh, Duncan Johnson from Stuff. Peter, uh, talk of some more practice races or something. I mean, I imagine you guys would be pretty keen to get involved in something like that. Yeah, well, we haven't actually really talked about it as a group, but, yeah, I think we, we really enjoy sailing these boats against, you know, other people. And, you know, this period's obviously been a huge opportunity for everyone to, you know, get all the systems working on board that, you know, talk between the race yachts and the, the events. So. <laughs> That's um, something that I'm sure if there was more practice racing would be taking part. What's your um, agenda this week? Will you be out uh, in the lead up to Christmas now, the next couple of days? Yeah, we plan to sail before Christmas, but um, yeah, I think kind of similar to what Terry said, you know, we've obviously got a fair few things on our list after this week as well, and you know, we're just really looking forward to you know, getting back into some, some development. Doug, you have a question? Just, sorry, Todd Nile from Stuff for Ian. So is, is the margin too tight on the wind? Is the margin at the lower limit and the unsaleable, is that too tight? Does it need to change? Um, well, it, you know, it, it's... it's it, I think the issue is is when the wind goes under the limit during the race, you know. So 
with all the good intention of starting the race in six and a half knots or above, which is exactly the case that happened today. But I suspect up in that northwest corner of the course, there was, you know, I wasn't there and there wasn't any wind breedings, but it, it looked, you know, to be probably under five knots of wind up there. So, you know, that is the difficulty is getting that consistency across the course at all the times. Um, so, you know, where do you measure it? When do you stop measuring it? You know, there's no perfect answer to all of that. So, you know, we have a rule. It's, it's basically a rule that's been there since San Francisco. Um, whether we need to adjust it or not, that, you know, the teams, if they agreed to adjust it, well, it would be adjusted. But, um, you know, it sounds like uh, we have lower and higher down here to my left, so it probably sounds like it won't get adjusted. Peter Montgomery? Wait for the mic here. My question to Ian Murray, um, I'm asking this because we didn't have the chance to speak to you yesterday. What did you learn when uh, you had to shift the course, threading the needle through the Rangatoto channel, when uh, someone, Murray Jones, made the point it was easier to shift Rangatoto Island than shift that armada of boats? So uh, what, what did you learn, not necessarily for you or the safety people, the harbour master, the police and every other Uncle Tom, Dick and Harry who were involved in this because there was a lot of time wasted? Yeah, we lost about an hour yesterday trying to, you know, um, you know, we made the move to move the course an hour before the race and it took an hour after the scheduled race time to, to, to clear the course area. Um, look, what I learned from yesterday is that the New Zealand people are out there in mass and they're all trying to do the right thing and the communications to them needs to be improved. So, you know, I think there's um, a willingness on behalf of everyone, whether it's the Maritime or the Harbour Master or, you know, the event people here is that, you know, and whether we utilise your magic tongue, Peter, on the radio, you know, we need to do a better job as communicating, you know, what we need to do. People, you know, it's sailing's a really complex sport and to come up with an instantaneous answer and get people back behind the lines, um, you know, it, it's it's difficult to probably understand three-dimensionally and, and the people were really willing. So, you know, I think the ball falls in our court to debrief, address the situation and come up with a better solution. And Bruno, through you, uh, could we go back to Francisco with his suggestion of trying to pick up uh, the delayed Christmas Cup? Does he have a date in mind? Could it be between Christmas and New Year? Or could it be closer, maybe five days out from the start of the Prada Cup on January 15? Francesco? Oh, there's Francisco. <laughs> Do you have a date in mind, uh, Francisco? No. The first thing we have to check is the agreement with the defender. And then uh, we will start from there. Thank you. No more questions? Zoom. OK. Hola. Here we are. First question from Zoom. Mark Reid, as usual. Uh, thanks, Bruno, and thanks, guys, for hanging around uh, and such. This is for Terry. Um, what is the one thing that you learned about your boat this week that you didn't know before the start of the regatta? I think what we learned this week is where uh, Patriot stands against the fleet, and that's, uh, that was never really known before the start of the regatta. And so it really has allowed us to set a baseline for development over the next uh, you know, however, three weeks that we have to the start of the Challenger Series. Next. Are you happy with the progress your boat made this week? Now, say again. Say again. Are, yeah, he, he Are said, you happy with the progress? Oh. Yeah. Are we happy with the progress the boat made this week? Um, yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, it's a little bit about the strengths and weaknesses. So we learned a bit of both, and, and um, you know, I think that's you know really it's something like this that's all you can can hope for is to understand uh where you are weak and and develop those weaknesses into you know at least not being being uh, a complete deficit in a condition and so 
you know, I, you look around um, the fleet and there's a lot of really good ideas in the other boats. And so, you know, you're always analyzing and comparing what you have versus what the three other teams have. And so it's, it's good to see some of our, some of our ideas, which, you know, seem to be working and at the same time grab onto a couple of others that, um, that you can implement into your own, you know, be it sales or, or techniques in sailing the boat to make the boat go faster around the race course. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Another question from Ed Gorman. Hi, everyone. Uh, question, please, for Ben Ainsley. Um, ben, it's very noticeable when you guys first arrived in New Zealand, there was a lot of confidence in the team. I think that was very plain to see. And obviously, the situation has changed dramatically. I'm very interested to know how you're dealing with the morale amongst the troops, as it were. Uh, you've got a lot of people out there, and obviously this team is going through something of a shock. Could you just give us a feel for what's happening morale-wise and how you're keeping, uh, keeping the team on track? Yeah, hi, Ed. The, yeah. Morale, in, the morale in the team is, is actually unbelievably good, and I'm not just saying that because I'm sat in front of the you know, world's media and trying to string you guys a line. Uh, I'm uh, always super impressed with the team. You know, this cup has process has been difficult for all of the teams for a number of different reasons, global pandemics just being one of them. And our team has always reacted incredibly well and they're reacting incredibly well to this situation. Um, we've obviously, you know, talked a lot about, you know, our performance is not where we want it to be. You know, our designers are working through the night to try and find solutions to that. Our shore team, you know, continue, as we talked about the other day, continue to pull all nighters, dealing with, with technical issues that, that, that come with these boats, which are real man eaters. And the sailors, as you've probably seen on the water, I mean, the, the boats are fully audioed up. I don't think there's any hiding place. And I'd be surprised if someone was listening to our team and thought there were issues. I think our sailing team have been hugely professional dealing with, a, with uh, our, our speed challenges, you know, in a very high profile environment and, you know, support the designers, the rest of the team to try and find a solution. So, yeah, look, I couldn't be prouder of the team, how they're responding to this. And that's the mark of a really strong team. And that's why we can come through it. Thank can you. Can I follow up by asking you, um, would it be helpful for your team to have extra racing or would it actually do you think you need so much time in terms of in the shed and working and so on that actually it could could be more of a distraction to your program of trying to get get on 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 terms? Yeah, it's a really good question, and I think there are pros and cons to it for sure for us. Any time on the water, any time racing against the opposition is valuable. You're going to learn from them, uh, but at the same time, we've got to we've clearly got to make some changes. So, yeah, I I I can say. Uh, I'll give you a firm answer on that either way, but uh, it clearly has an impact. No more question, Ed? Okay, thank you very much. So the Prada Cup will start on the 15th of January, but the day before, on the 14th at 10 a.m. in the morning, there will be a press conference here. Happy Christmas to all of you, and thank you.